So <clears throat> the votes are in for your haikus. Um, and the winner, by a couple of votes, was poem four. Does anybody want to claim responsibility for poem four, the one about the cherry blossoms? Yeah, I knew you were going to be something because that's my poem. You voted for the decoy. So, I will look over the haikus again tonight when I get home and I will email the person who I think should get the extra points. Um, so I do want you to write another poem for Thursday. This time you're going to be actually working in what is one of the oldest forms in English language poetry. Because I want you to get used to working with different kinds of rhythms and different kinds of repeated sound. So you're going to be writing an Anglo-Saxon riddle poem. It'll be four to six lines long. Once again, it will not contain rhyme. The lines can be any length, right? There's no set syllable count. But each line has to include three stressed syllables that alliterate with each other. Does everybody know what I mean by alliteration? Everybody knows what alliteration is? OK, this is when the words begin with the same sound, right? So say like lamb, little, London. Now, if, if it makes this slightly easier for you, according to the rules of Old English poetry, all vowel sounds are regarded as alliterating with each other. So syllables that begin with A, O, E, I, U right, are all regarded as alliterating with one another. So hope that helps. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. Um, what I want you to try to do, right, since this is, a, this is a riddle poem, the point is for someone who reads it or hears it to guess what you're describing, right? So you're going to describe an object without naming it. Right. Try not to be so obscure that it's impossible to figure out what it is, but try not to be so clear that it's too easy, right? And don't include, when you submit the poem to me, what it is because I would like the opportunity to guess as well. And when you vote for which one of these you think is the best, I want you to also try to make a guess as to what the person's describing. Um, now, the reason why these poems don't rhyme, or the reason why they use alliteration to connect ideas rather than rhyme, right? we know that it's actually fairly difficult to rhyme in modern English, right? Compared to a lot of other languages. Compared to like say French, Italian, Spanish that have um, very regular word endings, right? A lot of words rhyme with each other in those languages. Um, in Anglo-Saxon, it is virtually impossible to make rhymes. So they use alliteration, they used alliteration instead. Now, as far as rhythm here is concerned, right? We're experimenting with different kinds of rhythm. The haiku is written in what's called a syllabic meter. Right. Syllabic means that all that matters is the syllable count. Right. It doesn't matter where the accents are, where the stresses are. Right. All that matters is that you have the right number of syllables in each line. Anglo-Saxon poetry follows what's called an accentual meter. Right. It doesn't matter how long the line is, how many syllables are in it, as long as you have a certain number of stressed syllables. Most modern English poetry, like sort of what we've been working with, with the various feet, is a combination of the two, right? We call it accentual syllabic. Yeah, Wimberg. Oh, I thought you had a question. Sorry. All right. So, I want to briefly take a look at one of the poems that we looked at last time but didn't talk about because I think that this poem 
is a good example of why paying close attention to rhythm matters um, in poetry. Uh, I think, you know, a lot of you wrote about this poem and I think we're a little bit off about what was going on. We're kind of misled by the central theme of the poem. So if we look uh, at the W.H. Auden poem, Stop All the Clocks, Cut Off the Telephone, it's in page five, on page 556 if you have the green book. Pardon? 802. 802 in the red book. Thank you, member. So on the surface, what is this poem about? What is it describing? It's describing a lover's own, I mean, like how she's feeling out there, or he or she's feeling out there, I don't know, someone is. Yeah, yeah, the speaker is describing his or her feelings upon the death of a loved one. Is this just, is this just the one that we didn't get to last week? This is the one we didn't get to last week, okay, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. Stop all the clocks, cut off the telephone, prevent the dog from barking with a juicy bone, silence the pianos and with muffled drum, Bring out the coffin, let the mourners come. Let airplanes circle moaning overhead, scribbling, scribbling on the sky the message he is dead. Put crepe bows around the white necks of the public doves. Let the traffic policemen wear black cotton gloves. He was my north, my south, my east and west, my working week and my Sunday rest, my noon, my midnight, my talk, my song. I thought that love would last forever, I was wrong. The stars are not wanted now, put out every one. Pack up the moon and dismantle the sun. Pour away the ocean and sweep up the wood, for nothing now can ever come to any good. So when you read the poem out loud, what kind of rhythm does it have? Does it have the kind of rhythm you would expect for a funeral poem? What should a funeral poem sound like, do you think? What sort of rhythm should a funeral poem have, slow or fast? You would think kind of like slow and dirgy, right? Does this poem have, a, it has long lines, but does it have a slow rhythm? If you read a line like, prevent the dog from barking with a juicy bone, right? A lot of these lines have an almost kind of jaunty Dr. Seussy kind of rhythm to them. And what about some of the images here? Uh, even, you know, the one that I just mentioned, right? Prevent the dog from barking with a juicy bone. Like, does that seem in any way related to mourning or to funeral? No. It seems kind of ridiculous, right? It seems kind of silly. The level of mourning that we see here as well, right? The demands that airplanes circle moaning overhead, scribbling in the sky, make all the policemen wear black cotton gloves, right, put out the stars. Does all of that sound a little bit over the top? So how sad is this poem genuinely supposed to be? If we dig into the rhythm and the imagery a little bit, right, what we see is what we've actually got here right, is satire. Right. The sound of the poem cuts against the surface meaning here. So this is one of the reasons why I want you guys paying very, very close attention to not just the words on the page in a poem, right? But the way the words sound when you read them out loud. And I know that yeah, we often feel a little bit ridiculous when we read poetry out loud, particularly if our roommate happens to be there and is watching or some such thing, right? But it really, really will help you to understand what's going on in the poem if you do try to read it out loud and just think about what it actually sounds like when it comes out. Right, because sometimes the language itself 
can be a little bit misleading. So let's talk today then about imagery. What is the central image that all three of the poems that you read for today share? Yeah, they all concern, in some sense, a rose, right? This is a fairly conventional poetic image. So what connotations do you typically associate with this image? What do you think of when you think of a rose? Love. Okay, it's love. It's the flower of love, right? Delicate. Okay, that's delicate. What other ideas do you associate with roses? Red or white. Okay. And red or white roses mean different things, right? Could be good. Never. Pardon? Never. Yeah, um, do we typically send, send roses when someone dies? Mm -hmm. That's, yeah, lilies are more the funeral flower, right? Beauty. Beauty. Mm -hmm. Okay, what else? Other ideas that you associate with a rose? Okay, yeah, the number matters, right? What's the difference between getting one rose versus a dozen roses? How do these mean a different thing? At what stage in a relationship are you likely to get or give just one rose? Yeah, early, right? The one rose right, is a marker of romantic interest, right? I am interested in you, I wish to pursue you, I give you this single rose, right? The dozen roses when does that usually come? At what stage in the relationship are you if you're getting or giving a dozen roses? One year. One year. Or just later. Yeah, later. It means the relationship is established by that point, right? Sure. Somebody who, yeah, somebody who is giving someone they barely know a dozen roses, right, is probably pushing it a little bit. So yeah, the, the dozen roses usually <laughs> refers to an established relationship. Now what do we see in all three of these poems? Are we seeing single roses or multiple roses? Each of these are single roses, yes. That is one common thread that we see across them. Do these poems seem to be using this single rose to mean quite the same thing though? Let's start with the Edmund Waller poem. Let's start with uh, Song on page 596. Pardon? 851 if you have the, the red book. Okay, so can I get a volunteer uh, to read this for us? Yeah, go ahead, Dalton. Uh, go, Walter Rose. Tell her that waste her time in me, that now she knows. When I resemble her to thee, how sweet and fair seems to be. Tell her that she won't, and shuns to have her grace is five, that hast thou sprung in deserts where no man abide. Thou must have uncommended died. Small is the worth of beauty, of beauty from the light retired. Bid her come forth, suffer herself to be desired, and not blush so to be admired. Then die, that she, the common fate of all things rare, may read in thee how small a part of time they share. That's so wondrous, sweet, and fair. Great, thank you. Okay, so what does the rose seem to mean in this poem? Okay, beauty. Why would you say beauty, Juwan? Okay, when I resemble her to thee, when I compare her to thee, right, how sweet and fair she seems to be. 
So what is he suggesting there about the woman to whom he is sending this rose? Yeah, that she's more beautiful even than this particular rose, right? That compared to the rose, she's better. What else is important about the rose in the poem? Is, does it just represent beauty here? Okay, why time, Juan? Mm -hmm. Yet the common fate of all things rare may read in thee how small a part of time they share that are so wondrous, sweet, and fair. Yeah, a rose, particularly once you've cut it, right, doesn't live very long. So this beauty that he has sent the rose to celebrate, right, is fleeting beauty. Fleeting. It's not going to last. Right? Time makes all things fade. Time makes all things die. So, why would he send this woman a rose to remind her that one, she is beautiful, and two, that beauty dies? Well, what can we tell about the woman, the speaker sending the rose to, or at least how she perceives herself, or he thinks she perceives herself? Go, lovely rose, tell her that wastes her time in me, that now she knows when I resemble her to thee, how sweet and fair she seems to be. Tell her that's young and shuns to have her graces spied, that hadst thou sprung in deserts where no men abide, thou must have uncommended died. He sounded like to me at first when I was reading it uh, that she's like kind of hesitant, maybe. Mm -hmm. He's like a little older and she's not even fully committed or anything like okay. that. Okay. Is she hesitant just to just to get together with him? He's the inner man. Pardon? He's the inner man, really. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I said it's the inner man in particular. Okay, to any man in particular. Does she seem to be someone who is even out in society? Right. Tell her that's young and shuns to have her graces spied. What does that mean? That she shuns to have her graces spied. She don't like to be seen. Yeah, she doesn't want anybody looking at her, right? That hadst thou sprung in deserts where no men abide, thou must have uncommended died. So why bring up the deserts where no men abide here? What's he trying to tell her? About her beauty. That is purposely specific, and no, no one sees it or something. Yeah. What's the point of being as sweet and fair as you are if no one knows, right? If no one ever sees it. If a rose springs up in a desert with no one to see it, it dies unappreciated. So all this beauty of yours if you continue to shut yourself away, will go unappreciated. Small is the worth of beauty from the light retired. Bid her come forth, suffer herself to be, to, to be desired, and not blush so to be admired. Now this is sounding a little bit self-serving, right? That the speaker here clearly has an agenda, but <clears throat> How is how is the rose related to the two figures in the poem? What's how is it being used? What are they doing with it? Why does he send her a rose? instead of just going and talking to her. I mean, does he want Rose to speak for Like, what do, you, what, do you, what do you want to tell her? Yeah, he's addressing the Rose directly here, right, throughout the poem, not the woman. 
the speaker is talking to the rows. And telling it what to say. He's giving the rows the message that he wants to convey. And then essentially hoping that she gets it, right? So <clears throat> what are the odds, do you think, that the woman at the other end is likely to decipher his meaning? Yeah, I mean, she's probably going to receive it and read it as the conventional symbol, right? All of this stuff that he's putting into the rows, all the meaning that he's placing on the rows, is probably going to be lost on its recipient. Who's not being addressed directly. It's just the rows that's being talked to. So what we see in this poem here as well is sort of the difficulty of communicating through symbols. A symbol doesn't always mean the same thing to two different people. Right, you know, there are, <clears throat> you know, probably numerous examples we could take from daily life, you know, you know, symbols that, you know, offend some people, but inspire others, right? Symbols that people don't read in the same fashion. And by not communicating directly with the woman to who he sends the rose, he risks her missing his meaning entirely. Right. <clears throat> the typical meaning of a single red rose you send to someone, right, is just that love gift, right, that show of interest, right? The sort of thing you give somebody on a first date or when you're first asking them out. And while it maybe does sound a little bit like he's asking her out, he's loading a lot onto this that is not going to be obvious to her. Now, <clears throat> what's the rhyme scheme here? How's the poem set up? So wait, A, B, A, B, A, B, 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 yep. And all the stanzas seem to work the same way? Yeah. And none of them are rhymed with each other? Right, so each one is a, is a single unit, right? So we've got A, B, A, B, B, C, D, C, D, D, and so on and so forth. So, <clears throat> why do you think we start with these alternating rhymes that resolve into couplets? Think back to when we talked about the flea, right? and what couplets usually represent. What couplets were, what couplets meant in that poem, right? The couplets referred in that poem to the desire of the man to get together with the woman listening to him, right? So the couplets were representative of formation of a couple formation of a pair. So here, in this poem, we have, again, ardent speaker 
resistant listener, right? Resistant listener who's not even present. So the couplets are what he's trying to get to, right? He's trying to form a relationship with this woman. And the alternating rhymes that make up most of the rest of the stanza demonstrate the difficulty of this. Right? There's always something in between the coupling, something getting in the way before it can be resolved. So this is probably, of the three poems that you read for today, the most conventional use of a rose. Can I get a volunteer to read the Dorothy Parker poem um, on it should be on the next page with whatever edition. They're all sort of as a unit together. A single flower sent me since we met, all tenderly in the mess, drink me sodas. Deep, hard, and pure, with scent and dew still wet, one perfect rose. I knew the language of the flower yet, but for our dry leaves, it said his heart enclosed. Love long has taken for his violet one perfect rose. Why has no one ever sent me yet one perfect limousine? Do you suppose? I uh, know it's always just a lot to get one perfect rose. Great. Thank you, Dalton. So we could almost read this as the response of the recipient of Edmund Waller's rose, right? Who's the speaker in this poem? What can we determine about the speaker? A girl. Yeah, it's a woman, right? And what else can we determine about her? <coughs> she understands the message that, uh, or she's kind of sensitive to the message that she received. Okay, she understands the message she's received, right? Or at least interprets a message here, right? And why is she able to interpret this message? Are you looking for like clues within the poem? Or? Well, just think about, you know, like the idea of the single rose, right? I knew the language of the floweret. My fragile leaves had said his heart and clothes. Love long has taken for his amulet one perfect rose. Uh, I mean, what is in, in this case, it means just like a, you know, um, a physical symbol, right? Literally, what an amulet usually is, is you know, like, a, like a medallion you wear around your neck. Um, but yeah, in this case, just a physical symbol. Love long has taken for his amulet one perfect rose. Now, does the man who has sent her this rose seem to mean anything interesting or unusual by it. Yeah, it's just average, ordinary, conventional love gift, right? And how does she seem to feel about his gift? She don't seem to have done appreciative of it. Why would you say she does not seem to appreciate it? She's like, uh, why has no one ever sent me a perfect limousine yet? You know, uh -huh. always a perfect rose. It's always yeah. Perfect. Like, yeah, it it's like, yeah, like another fucking rose, right? Great. Yeah, so in this case, right, the, it's easy to interpret the message of the rose because its meaning is completely conventional. Right, oh, great, a single rose. He likes me, whoopee. Right? Another boring rose. We can even say like the rhythm and the repetition, right? Of that fourth line of each stanza. One perfect rose. Right? 
This is not her first rose and will not be her last. Right, this repeats and repeats and repeats. Yeah, Emily. It's um, always just my luck to get it. Like, mm -hmm. It's not a good thing. Like, that's how she's going to make it seem like that. Yeah, well, is, it necessar is she necessarily making it out to be a bad thing that she keeps getting roses? It's not like the best thing. Yeah. And again, like, what, why might the rose not be the best kind of, why, why might this not be the kind of gift she really wants? Because it may not be her type of... Uh, She's gotten some new of them too, like... Mm hmm Ah, uh, no, it's always just my luck to get, right? She's bored with it. It's conventional. It's overdone. It's hackneyed. Yeah, exactly. The rose is a cliché. She can easily read the meaning of the rose because it's a cliché. It's like, oh great, you gave me a rose. Aren't you friggin' creative? Now, a perfect limousine, right, at least would be different. But no, she always just gets that one perfect rose. Now, given the meaning of the single rose as well, we talked about this in terms of when people give a single rose as a gift. What else does this suggest about her relationships? <laughs> they don't get very far, yeah. If she's getting a lot of single roses, she's going on a lot of first dates and probably not a lot of second dates, right? So there's another layer to this. Right. Yes, the single rose is boring, but it also suggests someone who has been unsuccessful. In love, right? Um, would one person more than what it is? Well, what, 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 do you, what do you think it might mean, Jawan? Maybe she means like, Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it could be an indication that the kind of guys that she goes out with um, are <clears throat> maybe yeah are, are not of a high enough class, not wealthy enough to afford to really show her a good time in the way she wants. What else might the limousine represent, though? What, what are like, the two times in, an, in the average person's life when they might get to ride a limousine? Prom and marriage. Yeah, prom and wedding, right? So this is someone who's probably too old for prom. But the lack of limousine here right, also indicates here un, an unmarried state, right? I just keep getting these single roses. I keep getting these single admirers who show up for a couple of dates and nobody brings the ring, nobody brings the limousine. So in this poem, the meaning of the rose is primarily satirical, right? It's meant to be funny. It's meant to be a joke on the speaker's lack of success in romantic relationships. Right? It's an indication that she's not attracting the right kind of people. She's attracting people who are not creative and who are not committed. <coughs> Bless you. Now, <clears throat> if we turn to the William Blake poem on 598, what do we get here? Were you, were you able to make sense of this poem, The Sick Rose? No? <laughs> How many of you are completely baffled as to what's going on in this poem? How many of you think you have some idea what's going on in the poem? 
Okay. What do you think is going on in the poem, Nancy? Okay. So you think that. Okay. So what kind of sickness do you think is being referred to here? O rose, thou art sick, the invisible worm that flies in the night in the howling storm has found out thy bed of crimson joy, and his dark secret love does thy life destroy. This is page, if you have the green, you have the green book, right? This is 598. It's like, uh, it's like infected in some sense. Okay. Well, I'll say based on the time period, it seems like it could be maybe like plague or something. Okay, why would you say plague? Just because, um, like the time period in which it was dated and things like that, it was very popular. There's like a lot of poems written about it. Mm -hmm. like, I think the one last week. London and stuff like that. Like, okay. There's actually another, um, there was another illness that was uh, really, really common in England in the 1790s um, that relates to both this and the other William Blake poem. So there's that reference in the other William Blake poem to the harlot's curse. Anybody know what that is? Syphilis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, venereal disease was rampant in late 18th, early 19th century, urban England particularly. So <clears throat> that is one possible interpretation of the sickness of the rose in this particular poem, right? That the sickness referred to is syphilis, right? O rose, thou art sick, the invisible worm that flies in the night in the howling storm. So the invisible worm, is this where you guys got the idea of infection? That it sounded almost sort of like a germ or a bacteria? Yeah, and Blake probably wouldn't have really known uh, from germs, right? It wasn't really widely known at the time he was writing how disease actually spread. And he probably, you know, he was a poet and an engraver, so he probably would not have really been all that familiar with the processes. But, yeah, the idea of a kind of invisible creature, invisible spirit flying through the night, infecting people, right? That would have been fairly commonplace. Now, what about sort of the idea of a rose here? How might any of those conventional meanings of rose that we talked about fit into this particular idea, right? The rose infected. Now, a rose, we said, represents beauty, right? And it represents love. What kind of love does a rose re usually represent? Romantic. Yeah, romantic or sexual love, typically, right? You don't, you know, go and you know give your friend a rose like I love you, buddy. You know, that's not the kind of love that a rose is typically used to express. And the rose in this case is probably a person, right? He's comparing a person to the rose. What relationship do you think the speaker bears to this person, to this rose? Can you tell?
What was the question again? What relationship does the speaker in the poem seem to bear to this rose that he's talking to, right? This person he's comparing to a rose. Can we determine any relationship between the two? Yes, it's a woman. Okay, you, you, okay you, you imagine, you think the rose in question here is a woman, right? Yeah. Why do you think the rose is a woman? The last line. Okay. His dark, his dark secret love does thy life destroy. Destroy. It's feminine. Okay, why do you associate destroy, a destruction? I, I, I guess I'm, I'm, not, I'm just not quite seeing the connection between destroy and woman. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm looking at the end. I guess uh -huh. the end pattern, worm. They all sing syllables. That's why I get it all masculine. Oh, oh, you're oh, you're talking about the rhyme scheme. Yes. Oh, okay, all right, yes, okay, all right. Worm, storm, Night. joy, destroy. Well, is that actually a feminine rhyme? Right. It's a two-syllable word, right? But the rhyme still falls on a single syllable stress. For this to be a feminine rhyme, it would have like you'd have to have both syllables of both words rhyme, and it would have to end on an unstressed syllable, right? So, you know, the example I used the other day for like little spittle, something like that. That would be a feminine rhyme. This is actually still a masculine rhyme. But we do actually have here, um, we have a weird rhyme scheme, right? Well, worm, storm, joy, destroy, right? That's not Worm and storm? Worm and storm are, yeah, that's an I rhyme. They don't actually rhyme when, they, when, when you speak them together. Good, good catch. And an I rhyme usually indicates what? Deception, trickery, right? Sleight of hand. Right, the poet is fooling you into thinking these two words rhyme. Yeah, well, the, um, the rose certainly seems to have been tricked in some way here, right? Right. The invisible worm that flies in the night in the howling storm has found out thy bed of crimson joy. Right. Something that's not supposed to be there has found its way in. And his dark secret love does thy life destroy. So there's a suggestion here as well of kind of like secret, illicit sexual behavior, right? I think that that joy destroy rhyme is particularly, particularly important in that regard as well, right? That this dark secret joy in which the rose is participating is also the thing that does her life destroy, right? This is what invited this infection, this invisible worm in.
So the sick rose in this particular poem right, represents beauty corrupted by some form of not quite above board, not quite kosher sexual behavior. Right, so the invisible worm may relate directly to the male figure sneaking in, may relate to venereal disease in some way, probably relates to both. So the rose can be, even as an image of beauty and of love, also an image of uh, a kind of corruption. Okay, so does anybody have any questions about any of this? Made it through all three poems. So um, <clears throat> for next time, I'm going to let you go a little bit early today. For next time, uh, the syllabus says go to the library. Um, that fell through. We're not going to the library. We're going to be doing the same thing, but just come, come here to class anyway. Um, we're going to be talking about um, <clears throat> how to use the library resources to find uh, adequate sources for the paper that you're going to be writing at the end of the term. Right? So we're going to be doing um, a kind of research session here in class. I also have uh, your last set of in-class writings to give back to you, um, so there's that.